Let me tell you what I've been doing here. I uh, wrote this book, The Rise of Nuclear Iran. I have been um, <clears throat> moving around the United States. I started what's called a traditional book tour uh, in New York City, where I launched this book last week. <clears throat> I moved from there to Washington, D.C., where I uh, continued with a presentation at the uh, Heritage Foundation. Um, all through this, I have a PR firm, which is part of the contract to produce this book, and they are putting me on uh, Fox Television, CNN, and a huge amount of talk radio. Um, probably, I think, one of the most important ways of getting a message out to not just the American people, but international audiences, are blogs. And um, a lot of my work, particularly here in California, has been with uh, some of the names that are well known in uh, the world of blogging, from Pajamas Media to Andrew Breitbart, and uh, a cast of uh, uh, perhaps a dozen others, uh, not just here, but also on the East Coast. So I very much value your being here because uh, many times getting out very serious messages uh, to international audiences uh, is difficult. You're constrained by what's ever on the agenda of the producers of the mainstream media and uh, the clock is ticking and other things are happening. And this is particularly important because what I have detected uh, after completing this book, The Rise of Nuclear Iran, is there is a shocking and I would say very worrying um, degree of complacency in many countries in the West about what is unfolding. Iran is getting closer to what I would call the nuclear finish line. Uh, just looking at the reports of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, which is a very imperfect body, but nonetheless is a body which reports uh, about nuclear facilities that it knows about. Uh, the IAEA, uh, in its most recent report that leaked out last week, um, estimated that the amount of low enriched uranium in Iranian hands is approximately 1,500 kilograms. Um, most experts on the nuclear issue will tell you that should the Iranians decide to engage in what we call breakout, moving from their uh, current, the current parameters of their uh, uranium production and going for weapons grade uranium or high enriched uranium, they would need about 700 700 kilograms of low enriched uranium to produce 20 kilograms of the high enriched variety which would be necessary for a single atomic bomb. So let's look back at the data I just put on the table. The IAEA in terms of the known amount of uh, low enriched uranium the Iranians already have in their stocks is saying 1500. All they need is 700 to produce the minimum of 20 for a single atomic bomb. In other words, looking at the current stock, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the least alarmist organization dealing with the question of Iran, they are now saying that basically the Iranian stocks are sufficient to produce two atomic bombs. Should the political decision be made in Tehran to go from low enriched uranium to high enriched uranium? You would think that the subject of Iran would be in headlines. You would think the subject of Iran would be part of the everyday talk about people who are concerned with international affairs. You know what? Even domestic affairs in the United States. But no, there's a large degree of complacency and, and, and quietism when it comes to the subject. I'm going to try and share with you my impressions of why that is. First of all, a lot of things are not stated openly. They're not stated, you know, in a... Um, news item in the New York Times or in the Washington Post, but they are things you hear when you talk to people. You hear about what is sort of the a chatter behind the scenes. And part of that behind the scenes chatter is, so what? If Iran gets nuclear weapons, didn't Pakistan get nuclear weapons? Did the sky fall? No. And didn't uh, North Korea explode two atomic bombs? Did the world collapse? No. So, by extrapolation, 
there are those who say, should Iran, far off somewhere in the Middle East, obtain nuclear weapons, it's not the end of the world. This is a terrible misreading of both Iran and the strategic situation surrounding that country. Pakistan is a country that has been absorbed with the threat of India from its standpoint. And therefore, any nuclear potential it has is largely focused on the Indian problem, although there is a special Pakistani issue should Pakistan collapse and Al-Qaeda take over its, supply, its uh, nuclear capacity. But Iran, excuse me, Pakistan is not a country that is looking for new external targets. North Korea. As far as I know, She's not country with what? Not looking for what? new uh, targets abroad. Oh. North Korea. As far as I know, North Korea does not plan to conquer the Japanese islands. North Korea has its own considerations. It's a problematic country, particularly because of its export of uh, advanced uh, technologies to uh, unstable third world countries. But unlike the case of Pakistan and North Korea, Iran is a country with clear expansionist aims. This year, in Kaihan, the newspaper associated with the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, there were repeated articles talking about Bahrain, an independent Arab kingdom next to Saudi Arabia, as a province of Iran. Iran is a country since the dawn of the Islamic Revolution that's committed to the export of that revolution around the Middle East. And we see evidence of that. It's not just that it's written in the Iranian constitution, but one sees the Iranian support for the insurgency of the Taliban in, in Afghanistan. One can also see that the Iranians still support the Shiite militias in Iraq that are fighting the coalition troops. We in Israel, of course, are fully aware of the Iranian role in supporting Hezbollah since the day Hezbollah was born. In fact, Iran created Hezbollah. And we can speak about that later. Iran is now fully backing Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Since Israel abandoned the Philadelphia route in southern Gaza, Hamas operatives go through the tunnels under the Philadelphia route go from Egypt to Syria, from Syria to Tehran, and there they train with the Revolutionary Guards. They come back the same way. Uh, it was disclosed that um, Iran has been sending supplies to Hamas through Sudan. And Israel apparently undertook certain military actions to try and intercept that movement of weapons. The best expression of what Iran is doing in the Middle East was actually put forward by a former senior officer in the Bahraini Defense Forces, who I refer to in my book, The Rise of Nuclear Iran. Uh, he calls Iran an octopus. And he says the tentacles of Iran are spread across the Middle East, reaching into the Gaza Strip, reaching into Lebanon, reaching into the Gulf, reaching into Yemen, reaching into the Horn of Africa. So on, that is not the situation with North Korea, and that is not the situation with Pakistan. And that country, which is today the largest exporter of terrorism in the world, is about to cross the nuclear threshold. And people do not understand the significance of that moment. A second reason why perhaps there's a certain amount of complacency is another incorrect thought. There's the idea, you know what? Soviet Union had nuclear weapons during the Cold War. The United States has this huge arsenal still of uh, Minutemen missiles, of nuclear submarines, Trident. So you don't say this out loud. If worse comes to worse, America will have deterrence. The closest hint we have to that was the statement of uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who offered a defensive shield or umbrella to the states, to the Arab states, who are today as concerned as Israel about the Iran, about Iranian expansionism and Iran's acquisition of nuclear weapons. What does that extended deterrence to the Gulf mean? It means America is considering that deterrence may be the model. 
Now, do, do the deterrence concepts from the Cold War, U.S. versus USSR, work in the Iranian case? Do they apply? I think there are serious problems of, of making that equivalence. First of all, who is the object of your deterrence? When the United States deterred the Soviet Union, it was deterring a communist country that, as far as I can recall, never sent suicide bombers against the West. There's no such thing as communist suicide bombers. The whole notion of sending suicide bombers really came out of Iran and Hezbollah and then was taken by the Sunnis and applied by them. Although I think the first case was actually a Christian working for a Syrian organization. Well, this is in, in, that's in different theater. I'm talking in our theater of operations, in, in, in the Arab-Israeli sector. So there's a, a complete difference with respect to the thinking of those who are on the Iranian side in comparison to the Soviet case, which makes the analogy extremely difficult. Now, I know there are people who believe that the Iranian leadership is capable of collective suicide bombing, of deciding that it's willing to sacrifice itself in order to achieve what, in its view, would be a higher aim, like destroying the state of Israel or attacking the West and the United States. I don't go that far in my analysis. In my analysis, I have a different conclusion. I think the Iranian leadership, whether religious or whether revolutionary guards, I think they want to live. But I think they're prepared to sacrifice Iranian civilians in far greater numbers than the West ever considered. How do I know that? Look at the Iran-Iraq war. Started in uh, September of 1980 when Saddam Hussein invades Iran and takes Iranian territory. By 1982, the Iranians had recovered all the territory they lost to Saddam. They should have ended the war then, but they didn't. They fought another six years till 1988. They lost hundreds and thousands of people for no purpose except what? to maybe capture Karbala and Najaf, the Shiite holy cities in uh, Iraq, and to defeat Saddam and bring him down. That, to me, shows that this is a regime and this is a leadership that doesn't have the same calculus of deterrence that we knew about in the West. Again, not because they want to commit suicide, because they're willing to sacrifice hundreds and thousands of their own people. And therefore, anybody who comes forward and says, oh, we'll rely on deterrence in the same way that we had it during the Cold War, I think is making a huge error. But I'll tell you where my, real con my biggest concern is. And it's not that the Iranians are going to one day get a nuclear um, uh, bomb, fashion a nuclear warhead, and fire it at the West. I think there's much more subtle use of nuclear power, even if it's never used. And that's what I call in my book a nuclear umbrella for terrorism. Think back for a minute. The United States was attacked on 9-11 by Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was based in Afghanistan under the Taliban. Now, did Afghanistan have nuclear weapons back in 2001? No. Did they have long-range missiles that could hit Berlin or London? No. And therefore, the United States and its NATO allies had freedom of maneuver to retaliate, retaliate against an attack on American territory and say to the Taliban, you attack the American homeland, we're taking down your regime in Kabul. No, right. The... Um, Taliban survived on the Pakistani border, and they're still causing trouble today. But a message could be sent. If you give sanctuary to global terrorism that strikes at the heart of the West, you will pay with your regime. Now let's go from 2001 and fast forward to 2011 or 2012. Iran has nuclear weapons. It's able to put them into uh, ballistic missiles that can fly towards European territory maybe even eventually the eastern seaboard of the United States, if you study the trends in their uh, missile program. And then what happens when international terrorism strikes a western city and the West has to consider, does it retaliate? Does it go back to Iran? Whether it's Hezbollah that carries out this operation from new bases in South America, or whether it's Al-Qaeda, which now has sanctuary in Iran. 
Shiite or Sunni terrorism. Either one could be under the Iranian nuclear umbrella. Does the West have the freedom of maneuver to operate against international terrorism under a nuclear umbrella the way it had freedom of maneuver after 9-11? The answer is no. Therefore, Iranian nuclear weapons change the global balance of power with respect to terrorism. They undermine the achievements of the United States and its Western allies in the war on terrorism up until today. That's a good reason not to be complacent. But complacency is out there. The final factor, I think, affecting a certain degree of complacency and inaction is a notion that may not be as strong as it was in January of uh, 2009, but it nonetheless commands a very strong following in Washington. And that's the idea of, what, of, of engagement. That the United States will be able to sit with Iranian diplomats, engage with them, don't treat them as international pariahs, as the Bush administration did, and reason with them to freeze their nuclear program. And as you know, uh, Pre President Barack Obama has suggested that engagement should be the policy that would be uh, pursued. Although in Newsweek in May, he was already making sounds like, I'm not sure it's going to work. Now, in my view, and I explain this in the book, I don't want to get into American domestic politics, but engagement's been tried and didn't work. Most people forget that between 2003 and 2005, the European Union, what was called the EU3, negotiated with the Iranians a suspension of their uranium enrichment program. There were, in fact, two agreements reached, one called the um, Tehran Agreement, the other called the Paris Agreement, and the engagement failed. In fact, the best understanding of how engagement works in the Iranian mind was given to us by the chief Iranian nuclear negotiator in those years. His name was Hassan Rouhani. He worked for uh, Mohammad Khatami. And after he was fired by Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, he confessed in Iran what his achievements were. He was sitting in front of an Iranian audience. It was a closed meeting, but it was later leaked. And in it, what did, uh, Moha what did uh, Rouhani say? He said, while our negotiators were talking with the Europeans, our engineers in Isfahan were working in double shifts to complete the uranium conversion plant there. In other words, the Iranians exploited negotiations to move themselves down the nuclear road to their goal of being a nuclear weapon state. Therefore, I would say, if the West makes the mistake in September of saying, let's give the Iranians another six months, those six months will be fully exploited by Iran to bring themselves closer to their goal. What's the bottom line? The bottom line is that I think, first of all, in the West, and that's why I wrote this book, the magnitude of this problem has to be understood. The seriousness of the moment has to be internalized. I can't tell the United States, I'm an Israeli citizen, a former Israeli diplomat, I can't tell the United States what to do. I do lay out at the end of my book some of the legislation that's being discussed in the U.S. Congress by Democrats and Republicans, such as the gasoline quarantine. But if the magnitude of the issue is fully perceived, it is my hope that those who have to fashion the foreign policy of the United States or the United Kingdom, I will, by the way, be in England on October 12th with the same message, uh, hopefully they will suggest more robust measures to deal with this problem. But the most dangerous thing that can happen is if a kind of intellectual complacency sets in. The United States and its allies are very strong. The weakness can be in, what I, in this complacency. And so what I'm trying to argue is that the complacency has to be set aside because this is a serious development and it can't be ignored. I'll stop here and I'll gladly take questions. Everybody can try to keep their questions in the form of questions. Um, and somewhat short because we are somewhat limited on time and we'd like to give as many questions as we can. Are there any questions? Very much. Uh, you've spoken before uh, of a cottage industry in the United States foreign policy community that spins pretexts for engagement, either uh, peeling off moderates or the rationality of the regime. Do 
you think they were broken, uh, that they lost their credibility in the recent, uh, after they predicted that the elections would go smoothly and then it was clear that Khomeini was uh, closely allied with the IRG, or do you think that they still have sway within Washington? Well, another aspect of what the cottage industry does is it tries to put out, I would say, inaccurate information about what Iran is up to. I'll give you an example. Uh, I run the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and one of our speakers was Uzi Rubin, who was the father of the uh, Aero Missile Program. And Uzi Rubin noted something very disturbing. There's an institute called the East-West Institute. I had never heard of them. I've heard of Brookings, I've heard of Heritage, East-West, never heard of them. And they created a team of Russian and American specialists to look at the um, Iranian missile program. They came out with a report with great fanfare. And there were two very important conclusions in this report. Number one, that Iran could not hit European territory and num with ballistic missiles. And number two, that they only had liquid-fueled rocket engines. They did not yet have solid-fueled rocket engines which led them to believe that the Iranian missile program has been largely hyped and isn't as severe as some people characterize it. Several days, oh, one more, more thing, when this report was issued, it got tremendous press coverage. Los Angeles Times carried a big piece on it, Washington Post carried a big piece on it. It helped calm people and get them to not be as concerned about this as they maybe should have been. Several days after the report was issued, the Iranians launched a new missile. It's called the Sejil. The Sejil had two characteristics. It was 2,000 kilometer range, maybe a little bit higher. That means it could hit European territory. And number two, it had solid fuel rocket engines, not liquid fuel. And that was the whole report, which got all this coverage, was seen to be baseless. By the way, if you ask me what the interest was in putting out this report, from the Russian side, not the Americans who participated, the Russian side. The Russians have an interest, and they will make an effort to join with Americans who want to co-sign a report. They want to show that if there is no threat to European territory, America can dismantle its missile defense systems in the Czech Republic and in Poland. That's the interest. And therefore, this report came out and was proven to be baseless. So that's part of the cottage industry. It's not a cottage industry that looks only at uh, Iranian intentions, but it also looks at Iranian capabilities and presents them in the most forgiving light. I believe in something called the struggle of ideas. And if the struggle of ideas didn't exist, then the people who are in the cottage industry of trying to persuade you that Iran is okay would not be investing time and money in what they're doing. I mean, what is, what is the East-West Institute? It's the other side of the struggle of ideas. It's struggling to get you to go to sleep. And so I'm trying to at least wake people up. I don't want to be alarmist. That's why I wrote a book. I didn't write a five-page fax with you know, bold uh, headlines. But everything is reasoned. Everything is footnoted. You can check my sources. You can see, am I accurate or am I inaccurate? And again, the course of action that the allies, the Western allies decide upon is their business. It's their decision. But at least you should know what's going on. Now in the, um, I did something in the opening of this book. When you take off the cover, you can see a special map called Iranian Political Military Involvement Across the Middle East and South Asia. Now the purpose is in the, uh, the op uh, the, behind the opening cover, not the rear cover. And what you can see is that, in fact, that octopus that the Bahraini officer spoke about, which I referred to earlier, is very much alive. And that anyone looking at this map will go, true, Israel's got a problem. But so do a lot of other countries in the Middle East, and very important countries that are tied to the supply of oil to the West. The supply of oil affects the price of oil. The price of oil affects whether you will have an economic recovery or not. These are vital interests. So I just want people to see that this is not just Israel, not just Lebanon, not just the usual countries associated with the Iranian issue, but it's the whole Middle East region, from Afghanistan to Sudan. 
That is very important to stress, but I am not willing to say, I'm not speaking about Israel, because Israel is very relevant. The leadership of Iran, and not just Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, but also the Supreme Leader, also the Commander of the Revolutionary Guards, have all talked about Israel's elimination. And I think we don't have to be embarrassed to say that. But at the same time, we have to talk about the threats to others. And uh, that's, the, that's the fact of the reality which we're facing in the Middle East, which few people are discussing. And that's what I describe as perhaps the crisis of complacency that we're, we're facing here. My good friend. What about other delivery systems apart from ballistic missiles, like containers in a containers in a merchant ship yeah. or a submarine? That's a combination of terrorism and uh, so. I, mean, I think conceptually, you probably have to separate out between the ballistic ability and the explosive ability. No, I think that's a very good point. But when I was saying, for example, that let's say Iran engages in a terrorist act through a proxy through a terrorist organization that has sanctuary on Iranian soil. I didn't define what that act would be. It could be crashing planes. It could be bomb in a container. Dirty bomb even, yeah. And it could be a dirty bomb. Dirty bombs have already been assembled by terrorist groups. And we know that terrorist groups copycat each other. They can ship it to the harbor of New York. They can check the wind situation. They can threaten the whole... There's a lot of people who explore the whole EMP issue, which I don't get into in this book. But there are two facts that those who study the EMP issue take into account. That's electromagnetic pulse. That the Iranians, in fact, launched a missile from a ship in the Caspian Sea. So they tested the idea of whether they could use a ship as a uh, base for launching a missile. And second of all, some of their defense literature in Persian and Farsi discusses the EMP issue. I don't think that's conclusive proof that they're going to launch this kind of... Uh, EMP attack on the United States, so I'm not going to go there with that, with that kind of theory. But I think you're right. We're talking about terrorism of a whole array of terrorist possibilities. What I'm trying to say is the missiles come in to provide the umbrella against Western retaliation and therefore change the whole balance of power in the war on terror, which in my judgment still exists. Please. You're dealing with complacency is what you're targeting. That's right. Do you foresee a uh, lack of a better term, a tipping point or a body of evidence would be uh, assembled in our public discourse that might trigger actual action on the part of the West, specifically the United States. I mean, I don't think any of us expect Europe to do anything. Uh, but is it, with this book, with your previous books, have you seen that the, have you discerned that the awareness and the concern has been building or lessening? Is it falling on deaf ears? We have a new regime in Washington. Uh, they're the same people who said the Soviets were never going to attack us and why worry about anything. What do you see coming and what do you expect from this book? Is this incremental? Do you expect this to be a watershed? Do you see us anywhere near a tipping point where enough would have enough concern where we might actually take some action, the United States might actually take some action? I don't know what action the United States will take. I don't know if we're talking about a gasoline quarantine, which could be, have a very powerful internal effect on Iran. When uh, Ahmadinejad instituted gasoline quotas, he got riots in return. This happened a few years ago. In the current political environment in Iran, it could be, have a devastating effect. What do you so, think the effect would be measuring hostility back towards us if we or some other power took out their, uh, their gasoline refinery in their one terminal? I um, have intentionally decided not to go into what I call the Tom Clancy scenarios. And um, we always win those. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to do here is not say, do this. I'm not coming from Jerusalem with a message of, here is the menu of activities you have to undertake. I talk about it, as I said before, congressional legislation that's being discussed. But that is a decision that uh, American uh, policymakers have to make. Or when I go to London, British policymakers. But do you see any increase in concern as a result of the book? So these, these well, the, facts, book, these the, book, the book came out a week ago. But you said we have six months until they have the bomb, no? The atom. No, I say, first of all, uh, it could be that. Yeah. It could be a little longer. But all I can do right now without um, 
have being counterproductive is lay out the case of the problem. Right now, even that isn't being done. And I'm sure there are good patriotic Americans, good patriotic British subjects, or French citizens who will pick up the message and know what has to be done. They may decide to go the route, the route of the quarantine. If the quarantine doesn't work, they may decide something else. But I can't suggest what they should do. I can suggest what the state of Israel should do. What we should do. And even that I'm not going to say right here. <laughs> For those of us who believe the Jewish people are going to be abandoned as they were 70 years ago, do you think that the, the government of Israel has the political will to undertake a military attack if engagement and sanctions do not work? Again, I, perhaps because I'm a former Israeli diplomat, I'm not going that route. I'm not going to discuss military scenarios. You know, I was trained when I used to get questions about, so what are you going to do if Hezbollah attacks in uh, Kiryat Shmona? And I would say, we do not go into operational details. That's what I was told then. That's what I apply now, even though I'm a private citizen today, and I do not rep formally represent the State of Israel. Could you, in light of that response, could you address what you think might happen from the United States' point of view, in the sense that if we look back at 1981, when Israel took out the Azarat facility, the response to that was termination and hostility. So, you know, in the scenario that this gentleman raised, where Israel might take action on its own behalf, what would you speculate would be the response from Washington? Again, it's totally speculative. I'm not saying that Israel is going to go down that route. And um, what is true is that on the subject of Iran, what people say in public and what they say in private are very, very different. In particular, our Arab neighbors. Ambassador, you wrote a book about Saudi Arabia. I did. I understand them very well. And I know that I'm sure the Saudis do not want a nuclear armed Shia Iran next door. However, I don't trust. I mean, how do you trust the Saudis? Particularly if the Iranians say, we're not going to bother you or the oil, we're going to destroy Israel. How, how can we, is there any hope that we would count on Saudi Arabia as a counter? against Iran going nuclear, or are they just going to make a deal? I mean, they're not our best ally, obviously, in this scenario. The Arab states of the Gulf face a very harsh dilemma. Should they join in resisting Iran, or should they acquiesce to Iran? When the U.S. National Intelligence Estimate came out, one small but important Arab state in the Gulf went to the dark side. Meaning, uh, I'll use an expression, another expression from another, uh, another conflict, they were Finlandized. And I'm talking about Qatar. Qatar became a partner of Iran. And I speak about this in the book. But the other Gulf states are holding out. And much depends on the message they hear from Western allies. If they hear a message of ambivalence from Western allies, the danger that they will also be Finlandized and acquiesce to Iranian leadership will increase. They know in their heart of hearts that no matter what they say or do in um, showing their acceptance of Iranian hegemony, Iran will undermine them. And uh, therefore, they are extremely reluctant to go down that route, and they are very critical of the Qataris. Let me just go around the table and get others first. Any other? Please, Wiksha. <coughs> has been more attention between uh, Washington and Jerusalem ever since uh, Barack Obama got elected and then Netanyahu got elected. Mm -hmm. Do you think that affects in any way um, the eagerness of, of Washington to deal with the Iranian problem? I think the Israeli factor is overstated in U.S. policy on Iran. Meaning, I think the United States has its own calculations independent of, what, of Israel. And uh, I know some people try and speak about linkage between the Palestinian issue and the Iranian issue. Uh, Saudi Arabia, in my judgment, as much as they would like to see um, uh, Israel make concessions in the peace process, uh, would not make the defense of Ras Tanura oil refinery dependent on whether in the settlement of Itamar there are no more building starts. You said before that diplomacy has been tried and failed. It's a waste of our time. It's a waste of failed in the past, it's not a proper expenditure of energy. 
can you elaborate maybe on waste, which is not just a waste, but actually can be counterproductive, has been exploited perhaps in a dangerous way? Because that's an option that's being considered. Well, that's a very good question, Jeff, because the question was not just that the Iranians exploit negotiations, mm -hmm. but actually, and therefore, the, or no, it's not just that the negotiations don't work and have failed, it's that they're actually negative. They actually are detrimental uh, to our interests. And uh, I think the case of the EU negotiations is, is the best example. Because what didn't happen while the EU negotiators spoke with the Iranians? Not what did happen at Isfahan, which we spoke about. What did not happen? What did not happen was that the International Atomic Energy Agency did not refer Iran to the UN Security Council. You only get the first UN Security Council resolution on Iran in 2006. The disclosure of the Iranian nuclear program was 2002 by the Iranian opposition. They had four years to work on their nuclear program without worrying about UN sanctions. So that's an example of how a period of negotiation not only is exploited by Iran to move forward on the nuclear program, but also prevents the West from doing what it has to do, even just using the UN Security Council. I do decide to make a suggestion to our American friends that in a country in which there is a popular uh, insurrection for democracy and rejecting the uh, rule of not just the clerics, but especially the dictatorship that the Revolutionary Guards want to institute, uh, I think it would be a terrible error of the U.S. and its allies to take any action which grants legitimacy to that government. Right now, the Iranian government suffers from the loss of whatever legitimacy it had through the special status of the supreme leader, Vilyat al-Faqi. Uh, and his position is not the arbiter, not the man who's above both sides. He is now with one camp. And therefore his legitimacy has been badly damaged. And it is very likely that you're going to see complex moves on Ir by Iran in the period ahead. Although they are internally um, engaged, here and there you're going to see acts of external provocation. At the same time, while they do that, they're going to seek out legitimacy through negotiations with Western countries who will not hold them to any standard. And what the uh, legitimization of the Iranian regime will do, it will send a message to the Iranian opposition that their continued resistance is futile. And that would be a horrible error on the part of the West should it go down that route. Sure. Please. I have, a, I have a question for you in your capacity as a former UN ambassador, and that is with the meetings in the UN coming up in mid-September. Is that a forum to advance either the dissemination of this information or for Israel or a different state to take a public position that would affect this issue? Cool. Let's understand where we are. I said that the Obama administration came out with the idea of engaging Iran. Engagement already looked like a non-productive policy back in May. And President Obama said so in Newsweek. He said, I don't know if it's going to work. Today it looks even like a less likely policy, but there are many people in Washington who see it as the centerpiece of the Obama administration's Middle East policy, and therefore it's hard to jettison. Now, President Obama has said that he's giving to mid-September, he's giving the Iranians to mid-September to respond to his overtures. It doesn't mean to say yes to a specific proposal. What it means is they have to show that they're willing to negotiate in earnest. Now, it, that's commonly understood as the, uh, uh, that the Iranians have to come forward by the meeting of the G20 in Pittsburgh, 
Pennsylvania, not in New York City. And that's going to occur around September 23rd. So I think the month of September is crunch time. And the critical question is what the U.S. and the Western allies do by the time of the G20 meeting. Will they say, okay, you failed to meet our test, you failed to, correspond, to respond to our overtures, we are now adopting a completely new policy. Or will you see Western governments saying, we'll give you another six months. Or will you see some other ambiguous response? I'm going to tell you my concern. My concern is that if the response is ambiguous and the Iranians see that as weakness, the next Iranian move will be, and this is a possible scenario, what I call the breakout scenario. North Korea put its nuclear program under IAEA limitations. It had seals on its nuclear equipment and it had inspectors of the IAEA visiting its facilities. In 2002, the, Iran the North Koreans tore the seals. They kicked out any IAEA inspectors and within four years they conducted their first atomic test. They had, ex they had spent fuel rods from their, um, from their nuclear reactor f with which they manufactured weapons grade plutonium, not uranium, plutonium. The fact that the West failed to respond to the North Korean challenge, and we've had two, two atomic tests in North Korea, should be understood by the Iranians that they may be able to pull off the same thing. So the question is, will the Iranians perceive that, that there's a window of opportunity for them to go from the low enriched uranium to high enriched uranium? Because the West will do nothing. Much depends on the decisiveness of the Western response in September, in my judgment. I'm not, I can't predict Iranian behavior, but just looking at how this subject is managed, that is a scenario that I hope Washington is taking into account. Uh, on the question of Iranian intentions, it seems like literally every three days we go through a cycle of uh, a, uh, somebody goes rogue from the Iranian regime, says that they're interested in negotiations, three days later somebody goes on press TV, uh, the last one was Jalili and whoever they trotted out this morning. Uh, is that, uh, is that a, the calculated foot dragging that they were engaging in, shall we say, five years ago with the EU3, or is that signs of genuine, frack, uh, genuine dissension within the regime, that there are people sending out mixed messages? I don't think on the subject of uh, nuclear negotiations there are different schools of thought, debated in Iran. Everything is intentional and everything is controlled. Nobody in the Iranian system would dare express an independent view on the Iranian subject and publicly dis Iranian, excuse me, on the nuclear subject and publicly disagree uh, with authorized, uh, with an authoritative Iranian official. I think we're coming to the end. Has anybody not asked a question yet? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.